Hi all, thanks for joining. Uh, let's take a look at motion in mechanism design. Um, my name is Bill. So the objective today, of course, is to look at creating this motion. Um, and um, I'll first start off doing an introduction of myself and PDS Vision US. The topics covered are mechanism connections, um, simulating motion and joint axis settings, and server motors and analyses. Um, I'll do a live demonstration and we'll also have a little bit of time here for uh, Q&A. So my name is Bill Drosos. Um, I have experience in industrial design, rendering and additive manufacturing. A little bit about PDS Vision, formerly known as Boundary Systems. Uh, we are a tech leader. We are also a first PTC global reseller and preferred services provider. Um, some capabilities of ours include consulting, professional training, cloud, and our ever-growing help desk. This timeline below kind of shows the origin story of us. So we started off as Boundary Systems in 2006. Then between 2007 and 2008, PS Vision Group was founded in Stockholm, Sweden. And if we fast forward a little bit here, uh, we can see that between 2017 and 18, uh, Boundary was acquired by PDS Vision Group. Some other software solutions that we provide are, um, of course, the PTC software suite, as well as Tacton, Moldex 3D, Keyshot, and ITI. Uh, we're also taking a look at this um, digital thread concept, and this is basically a concept that speaks to the intersection not only of different applications, whether it's PTC or the others that we work with, um, but also the intersections of the applications themselves and different engineering departments. So the question is, what is a mechanism design extension? Uh, it enables you to communicate design intent uh, when components in assembly require motion. Uh, motion can be assigned to motors or by dragging, dragging components through their range of motion. And these analyses enable you to examine the behavior of your mechanism. Um, there are some essential components to creating these. Um, of course, connections are one of them. They're used in place of assembly constraints for running a motion analysis. Uh, there's also joint axis settings, which are used to limit the range of motion. We have servo motors. Uh, those are basically simulated motors that we use in Creo to apply force or get the um, angular motion. And we also have analysis definition and these analyses create a motion definition using the applied servo motors. So there's a bunch of different types of connections. Um, I'm sure most of these you guys have heard of. There's the pin connection, for example, slider connection, cylinder, planar, and rigid um, bearing slot connections and ball connections and these connections all have their own unique degrees of freedom as far as translation rotation that kind of thing so we'll take a look at that uh, we'll also take a look at some joint axis settings so we can also limit the range of motion um, that can also help us with eliminating interference and in components so that we can make sure that they're only moving to a certain point so they're not touching another component um, so those can all be specified here down below, like you see in the image. So in this case, we chose um, two different datum planes and we got the angle between those planes and we're specifying um, how far along that rotation of 360 degrees um, that component can turn. Um, servo motors, um, so we'll take a look at these here as well. Um, of course, we have linear and rotational degrees of freedom um, and those also apply when you're creating a servo motor and there's different servo types there's constant which is used to simulate a constant motion uh, ramp used to simulate a linearly changing motion cosine for example is used for oscillation and then we have scca used to simulate a cam as well as cycloidal and then we also have parabolic down here that we use to simulate a trajectory. 
analysis, the analysis definition window basically allows us to determine um, the you know length and rate of the analysis. So um, you know we can adjust the the end time. We can change it from 10, 10 seconds to twenty to thirty. We can also adjust the frame rate. And also to the right there, you can see that we can determine which motors that we're going to include in the analysis. All right, so let's dive in right now and get to it. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some commonly used connections and uh, what their degrees of freedom are. So let's first start off with creating a pin connection. So I'm going to go create an assembly here. And I'm first going to bring in a base component. So we actually want this base to be grounded. So we don't want any degrees of freedom in translation. We don't want it be, we don't want it to be able to rotate either. So in order to do that, we're going to change the connection type up here from user defined to rigid. And then from here, it's just a matter of me going in here and I could use this auxiliary window as well which is which makes it easier to constrain my parts and I can select the part co coordinate system and let's constrain that to the assembly coordinate system so yeah this creates a constraint that does, it does not have any freedom of, of movement so it can't translate in the x y or, or z direction you can see it's fully constrained there as well so I'll click OK Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'll find another component that we're going to apply a pin connection to. So I'm going to go in here and find a component to bring in. So here's here's this component, and at this point, again, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to change my connection type to pin. And I'm going to go to my placement tab, and you see the first thing it's looking for here is this axis alignment. So I'm going to choose the axis the part that we're assembling and align that there and we also need a translation connection as well or constraint so i'm going to grab this plane here and i'll grab another plane so you can see that we've locked in the axis alignment so we're aligned to axis a1 um, these datum planes are also aligned so it can't translate and you can also see that we have this rotational handle in blue here and everything else is white so we only have one color which is this blue handle and that means that we have one degree of freedom to rotate about the axis so that pin constraint just has that one degree of freedom okay there also are some limits that we can add here for the range of motion uh, we can do that here as well if we add a reference like i can grab this guy here and that guy and i can specify some of these limits here I can specify the zero position re regeneration position um, the, the minimum limit the maximum that could be done here uh, but we can also do that outside of the component placement window so that's the pin constraint that we're all aware of um, let's also take a look at another one all right and that's going to be the, the cylinder constraint Okay, so let's go ahead and bring in a component. So we have the shaft there, and now I'm going to go ahead and grab the handle part. Okay, so same thing. I'm going to change my constraint to cylinder, and I'm going to grab an axis on the part that I'm assembling and one on the shaft, like that. And I could also add an, another one as well so currently right now we just have the axis selected for that constraint um, and i can also add translational limits but you can see here that this connection the the cylinder connection as opposed to the pin connection has two degrees of freedom they can translate along the axis and rotate around the axis like that as well so the pin connection just has the one, one degree of freedom and the cylinder connection has two, like you're seeing here. 
we also have some in, some other connections that are pretty pretty interesting. You know, can't can't get to them all, but let's take a look at the Slack connection. All right. So what we hear, what we have here, is a a block part that was assembled as a um, grounded component and rigid. So if I go here to placement, you see it's basically locked in place here with a default constraint. It doesn't have any any uh, freedom of, of movement. And then we also have the carrier component. And if we go into this one, we see that we have this the cylinder connection, which gives us the two degrees of freedom to translate along the axis and rotate around as well. Okay. This plunger component here, uh, we actually want to create a slot connection. And basically in order to, to do that is we have to specify we have to specify a constraint between a point on the component and a curve. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new set. And I'm going to change this to slot. And you can see right off the bat, it's showing me that I need a, a point on a line. So I'm going to grab my tip point and this line right here. And I'll click OK. And now I have my slot connection. Now, we could also test this. This is pretty cool. So if I grab my drag components hand right here, it gives me the ability to select a component and I can drag that now along the curve. And you can see that as I do that, it, that, that component moves up and down along its axis, right? And the carrier component also has to rotate about its axis to follow that curve. So we have the, um, we have basically two movements, linear and rotational. Okay. And of course, I can take snapshots along this as well. So if I want to, you know, I could stop here, click on that camera icon, create that snapshot one, select my component, drag that along here, and create another one. And what's cool is you can actually flip back and forth between the different snapshots. So there's one, and then there's two. All right. We'll click close there. Another interesting connection type is the cam. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go straight to my mechanism application right here, and I'm going to hide some of these datums, make it a little bit easier to see. So we can see that we have this camshaft here and these valves, and the, the majority, or at least all of them except for one, um, have been mated to the cams. The valves have been made into the cams using a, a cam connection. So to do that, you come up here and find cams. And basically what I have to do is define, you know, select the curves on one of the valves. And then on the cam here. Then once I have that, Click OK, and you can see that that, that valve is going to bump up there to meet the cam. And it gets really cool here because now we have the ability to select the drag components hand again, and I can select that camshaft, rotate that around, and you can see that because we have that cam connection, those valves move as that cam rotates around. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the joint axis settings. I'm going to close out of this. Okay. So let's go ahead and open up our assembly here. Okay. Perfect. So one thing to mention here is we've assembled these components together. So we have a shock one, shock two, and we can notice that we have a slider connection for shock two. And basically that allows us to, to, to translate along an axis, but we really only have that one degree of freedom. 
the, the problem with this though is that if I take this component, the shock two, and I move it, you can see it can, it can disconnect from shock one. And if I pull it back to the other side, it can actually intersect with the component as well. So we don't we don't want that. We don't want it to be able to disconnect or intersect with it. So we have to do just a little bit of work here to get this where we want it. Okay. So let's go ahead and close this out. Go back to mechanism here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to find my translational axis for connection. You can see we have the connection first translation axis. I'm going to select that guy and I'm going to go to edit. And this takes us to the motion axis window. And this is where we can set our limits for um, how much this uh, shock two part can slide or move along along the axis. So. The first thing we're going to do is specify a, a reference for the movement. So we're going to grab the um, front planes in both these parts here. And then we're going to specify some settings. So I want the current position or the start position to be one. And we'll also make that one our regeneration value. So when we regenerate our, our part, it'll return to that position. So I'll make that one as well, and I'll enable the regeneration value. And then we're also going to set some limits here. So I want the, the minimum limit to be one and the maximum to be nine here. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Let me turn my datum planes on. So you can see that currently right, right now we have a distance of one here in that start position. And if I click my drag components, Again, notice what happens. So it starts off at one, but it can only move up until a unit of nine and then it stops. So we no longer dis disconnect from the shock one component and there is no intersection as, as well. So that's gonna, kind of showing how to, how to set those limits in a linear motion. All right, so now let's also select another one here, and that's it's going to be the uh, cylinder three assembly. So in this one, we have the handle on that shaft part that we worked with before. And we're going to do a, a similar thing here, except for, for this one, we have both a translation and a uh, rotational limit that we have to create. So the first one is going to be the translational one. So I'm going to right click in here and I'll find my translational axis like that. And let's go into our settings here. Okay, so the what we're gonna select as the um, surface as a reference is gonna be the surface of the handle and the surface on the shaft. So these two right here. So now they, we have a you know start start position of zero but we're also gonna have to go in here and you know make some adjustments here so um let me go in here and set my position so this should be a zero position here and also for the regeneration we'll enable that now the length of the shaft is is six so i want to make this a negative six in the negative z direction and then this guy is going to be zero like that. So now if I go in here and I apply this and drag that handle, you can see it's going to start off in that zero position, but it can only translate to a value of six because that's the length of the shaft. So that's exactly what we want. So now we're going to go in here, we'll make another constraint. I'm going to go in here, right click, and I'm going to choose the first rotational axis and then click OK. And we're gonna use the top plane on the handle and the shaft there as well. And we actually wanna set a current position of 45 degrees there. And that can also be our, our regeneration point as well. If, if we don't want that, we could also change. I can say, hey, let's make our regeneration value zero, but our current position to 45 like that. And then from here, we can specify our, our limits. So 
we could have zero and, and 180. So now that we have these created, we can test a motion again, and you can see that you know we can translate on the axis from zero to six units, and then we specified a, a range of zero to 180 to rotate along the shaft, so we can test that out. So here's a zero position, and it can rotate 180 there as well. Okay. All right, so now let's take a look at applying some servo motors. So let's go move to that area here. Okay, so I'm going to open up this pin assembly and I'm going to go straight into the um, mechanism application here. And I'm going to go to ser servo motors. We do want to apply a servo motor and select that. And then in here, um, I'm also going to, after I select that connection, I'm going to come in here to specify the motion axis settings like we were doing before. And I'm going to specify, and I'm going to use the top surface of that linkage part and that top surface of the base. And we'll create a current position of 45. You can also make the hour regeneration value like that and preview it. OK, so now that we're here, uh, we can go into the profile details tab. And you can see that currently we have this angular position setting. So we're not taking a look at any um, motion here necessarily. So. We have the ability to uh, adjust some of these graphs. And again, we have position selected. If I go to these graphs, you can see that the position is zero here. Velocity zero, we don't have any movement there or acceleration. Now, if I go in here and I change this, for example, to angular, to angular velocity, now I have some options for movement. I have constant, so it remains, so the actual speed remains constant, right? So I can change this here for the start point to be 45 to match our settings from before. So now the, the velocity has just updated to 45 degrees a second. So we see the 45 here in the graph. Position, this, this shows us, you know, what angle we're at, you know, as, as far as, you know, where where we are at a unit of, of, of time. And there's also acceleration, which is zero in this case. Um, if we want to ramp up our speed, we can change this to ramp. And we could have the starting point here, the starting um, angle here, and then also the degrees per second can be 36 in this case. And you can, in this case, you can see that this graph is going to update with the magnitude. So when we when we increase along the timeline here, you can see that our um, the revolutions are also going to update as well. And as a matter of fact, it's going to get so fast to the point that at 10, at 10 seconds, we're at 2,500. The velocity can also be shown here as well. Same thing, there's, there's the velocity along the timeline, and we get that steady increase there. OK, so once we have these inputs created, um, I can close this graph out. I can click OK. And I could also go to mechanism analysis and select that. And here's where I can, you know, adjust like the actual time. I can change that to 30, for example. I could adjust the frame rate if I need to. And then in, in motors, I can also check to see which motors we're going to use for the, for the analysis. We just have the one added. So we have motor one selected from the um, start to the end. And then from here, um, I can click run. And that's going to run through the analysis. And then I'm going to click OK. And what's neat now is I can come in here to my playbacks and I can select the analysis that I just created. <clears throat> just click continue here for a second. OK, so you can see that we have our frame. We're on frame zero. We have 450. We could 
drag this along and scrub. Um, we can also click play and kind of watch this. You can notice it's going to start off pretty slow. And also we have collision detections turned on as well. So you'll see some red lines and that's because there's components that it's interfering with and colliding with. So you can also have those settings selected. So as we wait here a little bit longer, notice because we have the, the ramp selected as far as uh, angular velocity, it's going to start to increase more and more as we wait here. Okay. I can also capture this. If I want to export the video, I can export the video. There's formats in there. There's MPEG. There's AVI. You can export the, the individual frames as JPEGs. Um, aspect. You can also change the uh, resolution here as well. And then, of course, browse to where you want to save it to. Um, I should have hit cancel on that one, but it's going to hopefully it's not going to take too long here. We have 350 of 450 frames almost done. OK, so that's completed and saved. What else is cool is I can come in here now too as well and say, say for example, um, we wanted to create a visual representation of the space claim that this linkage B part takes when it rotates around. Um, we can actually do that from this menu. So I'm going to come up in here and I'm going to choose this button to the right, create a motion envelope. And I can choose all the components. I can also just choose to grab one component. And then you can adjust the quality of the exported parts. So if you want more quality, you can click the up arrow to increase the quality. Um, I'm going to keep a level of one for now so it doesn't take too long to create this. So um, I'll click on preview. It'll just take a moment. Almost finished. So that's what it does. It's, it, it creates a part that basically shows the um, space that this component takes up when it rotates and goes through its range of motion. So when, it's, when it starts here, it's going to move up and swing along, then hump back up here, and then continue back down like that. So this is kind of nice. So you can actually save this out as a part, and then you could import that part into an assembly, and you'll know if there's interference between this link B part and other components in your assembly. Okay. So now let's take a look at an interesting analysis that we can do. So I'm going to open up this hydraulic boom assembly. And basically what I want to do is I want to take a look at where this point zero is on this bucket as this arm goes through its range of motion. So here's a starting point, but I want to see where that point zero is when the, when the motion takes place. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create another plane, and I want to offset that plane down here. And I'm going to come in, come in here and create an analysis. We'll do a distance analysis between the point zero and our datum plane, and we'll save that as a feature. So we'll make a feature there, and then we'll go back to our mechanism application. OK, so I first want to make sure that I run my analysis again so that I can use it. All right, perfect. So now I'm going to go over here to measures. And I'm going to select my distance feature that I just created between the point and that datum plane ADTM1. I'm going to grab that guy as well. And up here, I can go to this graph. So this graph basically shows 
where that datum point is in in space as that arm moves. Okay. So one cool thing that we can do is I can close this window out. And let me make sure I can see my datum planes and points. I can go back here to my playback. And then what I can do is I can make sure I have my point turned on as well, my, as well as my planes. And I'm going to come in here, how to position these you know, near each other so I can see what's going on in the assembly. What I can do now is I can click play. And notice that when I click play, we get this red line that's basically moving on this graph along the range of motion of that point. So right now, that point zero, we can see it here. In a moment, we'll be directly on the ADTM point. Now it's gonna rise back above in that Y direction and then come back down. And the graph is showing you where that point is in space there as well. So it's kind of neat that you can see it both in the graph along its range of movement or motion. Um, and you can also see it in the assembly if you have that datum point displayed as well as the uh, datum plane. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that brings me to the end here. Um, so I guess we can take a little bit of time for you guys to ask me some things that uh, you know, relates to this. Um, if you ever need to contact me specifically, my email is right there as well as sales. And you can also go and look at our videos on YouTube. Okay, so it looks like um, support the video output. Oh, great, great question. Um, any thoughts on when PTC will support um, the MP4? video output. Um, so let me actually just go back here a second and just take a look here at the capture. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I don't I don't know about MP4. Um, that's something that we could probably take a look at or just ask them, you just find a rep that, that we know and kind of ask and see if, if they know anything. Great question, though. Okay, let's see if there's anything else that I'm missing here. Okay, that's all that I'm seeing at this point. So I thank you guys for attending. And uh, contact me if there's anything else that you want to know. Thanks. Bye.